I can be guilty of romanticizing the past, thinking about how much better things were in old days and sometimes have a longing to go back to the old days. But then we have a day like today where we don't have air conditioning and you think maybe the old days weren't all they were cracked up to be. I certainly picked the wrong Sunday to wear a jacket, that's for sure. So anyway, and uh, as I see some of the papers, bulletins being used for fans, maybe we should coordinate with one of the local funeral homes and bring back the funeral home fans. Remember those, some of you, you know? So, Well, a few years ago, Cindy and I were <coughs> traveling with our daughter and son-in-law on a trip, and on our return, after we checked into the airport, cleared security, and got to our terminal, we had about an hour to kill, which was really way too much time for me. Now, you should know, I am somebody who doesn't like to carry things in his pockets. I don't like to carry keys. I don't like to carry wallets. I put loose change away immediately. I just don't like to carry things in my pocket, so keep that in mind. So after sitting around for a while in the terminal, I get a little restless. I get bored. So even though by this point we have about 30 minutes before boarding begins, I decide to go walk around, go look for something. Figured I wouldn't go too far, so I leave the terminal area or leave the, where my family is. Um, didn't take my phone, didn't take my wallet, didn't take my printed paper tickets. I was free. Just a word to the wise. Don't walk around an airport without your ID or your phone on you. So I'm just walking along, and all of a sudden I have this strange sensation that I have gone too far. And I stop, and I turn around, and I realize I had walked out of the secure area of the airport. I mean, by like one, maybe two steps at the most. And so I, I, I try to go back, and there's a security person sitting there on a stool, and she says, you can't come into this area. I said, I just came from that area. I just came from behind you. I didn't see you. You can't come back in this area. You have to go clear security. I said, I, 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 I uh, you get the picture. <laughs> I, I, I said, I'm not going to be able to make my plane. She said, well, show me your ticket and ID. Uh, we've got a situation. And she tells me the obvious. You shouldn't walk around an airport without your ID or your phone. My family doesn't know where I am. I don't have any ID on me. I don't have my phone. I'm stuck on the wrong side of where I need to be, all because I have a hard time with waiting, because I couldn't wait. And what's true of me in that airport, I think, is true for a lot of us in our walk with Jesus Christ. You see, if you are in Christ, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are right now waiting. We are all waiting. We are all anticipating the fulfillment of what Christ began at his death and resurrection. And that is, we are anticipating, we are waiting for the restoration of all things fully when he returns. The Bible says creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Now, waiting, this is not a new thing for God's people. God's people have always been a waiting people. God's people waited for deliverance from their bondage in Egypt. They waited for 40 years in the wilderness to go into the promised land. They waited for hundreds of years for the promised Messiah. And now we are waiting again. Specifically, we are waiting the return of our Lord to establish in full his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. However, if you are familiar with the story of God's people... <laughs> We know that God's people are as, as good at waiting as I was with waiting in that airport terminal, meaning we're not very good at it. We have a hard time with waiting. Why? Because it's hard for all kinds of reasons. And so in the waiting, 
We, we are prone to take our eye off the big picture. We get restless. And sometimes, if you feel like you're having to wait too long, like when you're trying to wait for customer service to take your call, or you're waiting for service in a restaurant, or waiting, or maybe you're waiting for that proposal for marriage that never seems to come, sometimes you end up giving up. Well, as we wrap up our series, Living by the Big Picture, our look at Psalm 37 today, after looking at how we are to live in the meantime between Christ's coming and his return, it is no surprise the last section that we're going to look at in Psalm 37 begins with these words. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. In these last few verses... The psalmist will paint a picture of why we should wait for the Lord. We should wait for the Lord because the Lord will not disappoint. We should wait for the Lord because he is faithful to fulfill his promises to his people, to those who belong to him. Waiting for the Lord is worth it. It will prove worth it. But the psalmist, he knows it's not going to be easy. Because for one, while you are waiting, you will be tested. You will be tested as you wait for the Lord. One of the ways we are tested as we wait is by all of the wickedness that is continuing in this world before his return. Sometimes it appears from our perspective that wickedness has the upper hand. And that's why the psalmist, again, lifts our eye to the bigger picture, to the final outcome of what will happen when all is said and done. He reminds us, see, the, the wicked and wickedness do not prevail, but those who belong to God, they will prevail. Wait for the Lord, he says, and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. I have seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree, but he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. So yes, those who wait on the Lord will prevail. Those who reject God in his way will not. That sounds easy enough, right? Simple enough, but is it? Is that enough to help you endure, to continue waiting, especially when you find yourself the target of those who are rejecting God and rejecting His Word? I mean, the Bible tells us you will suffer as a direct result of your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Yes, the Bible says everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Look again at that, at verse 34. What's it say? Wait for the Lord and keep his way. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. You see, waiting for the Lord is not a passive activity. We're not sitting at a bus stop, spiritually speaking, just twiddling our thumbs, waiting for God's bus to show up. No. Waiting for the Lord takes the form it looks like keeping his way, as the verse says. That's what waiting for the Lord looks like, keeping his way. Waiting for the Lord shapes how we live today. Just like waiting for the wedding day shapes how the soon-to-be bride and groom live their lives in the meantime. I mean, at the very least, they're not dating other people. Why? Because of the day that is coming. And so in light of that day, they live differently right now in anticipation. And the same is true for those of us who belong to Jesus, who are waiting for his return. We wait by keeping his way by living as if he has already returned and established in full his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. But here's the thing. As you keep God's way, 
keeping God's way will put you at odds with the world around you. At the very least, the world will find you odd as you keep God's way. The world will see you as weird if you are faithful to keeping God's way. The world will find you annoying <laughs> as you keep God's way. And sometimes the world will see you as a threat as you keep God's way. And so as a result of all of that, you may find yourself the target of ridicule, maybe the target of slander, maybe the target of oppression, maybe even the target of outright persecution. You will be tested sometimes directly. But sometimes you will be tested even indirectly. You know, we live in a culture that is saturated with deceptive philosophies. Now, those who promote and live by such philosophies and worldviews, they may not directly target Christians, but nonetheless, you will feel the impact of those deceptive philosophies and those who are deceived by them. Because we swim in the same cultural ocean as our neighbors. And so as a result, we often find our own convictions and values and beliefs undermined, corrupted, compromised, even without our being aware of what's happening. I mean, we don't mean to stray from God's way, but if we're not careful and intentional, we become like someone who's floating on a raft in the ocean. And before they realize it, they're further and further and further away from the shore. Sometimes even too far from the shore. Well, we can do the same. If we're not careful, just drifting along in this cultural ocean that we're in, further and further away from the shore of God's truth. Remember the big picture. Be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in the waiting, you will be tested directly and indirectly. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, speaks to how we can stay true to God's way when he writes, that is why daily prayers and religious readings and church going are necessary parts of the Christian life. We have to be continually reminded of what we believe. Something else that can happen as we wait for the Lord, you'll get restless. You'll get restless. You'll get restless in part because, like I said, it is easy in the culture that we swim in to lose our way, to become corrupted by the immorality and empty philosophies of those around us. We get restless in our walk with Christ. We get distracted by the temptations, by the philosophies of this world. It seems like everybody else is having a good time. It sure seems like the good life is found in pursuing your own interests, your own desires. Sometimes following Jesus can sure make you feel like you're missing out on what everybody else seems to be enjoying. And maybe that's why the psalmist reminds us in verses 37 and 38, consider the blameless. Observe the upright. A future awaits those who seek peace. But all sinners will be destroyed. There will be no future for the wicked. So while you are waiting, don't get enamored by those who live in defiance of God's best. Instead, seek out the godly. Do what they do. Watch them closely. Watch the blameless, the righteous, those who make peace. In his book, Atomic Habits, an easy and proven way to build good habits and break bad ones. James Clear speaks to the vital role that those closest to us play in the maintaining of good habits or even bad habits. 
He says one of the most effective things you can do to build better habits is to join a culture where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. New habits seem achievable when you see others doing them every day. If you are surrounded by fit people, you're more likely to consider working out to be a common habit. If you're surrounded by jazz lovers, you're more likely to believe it's reasonable to play jazz every day. Your culture sets your expectation for what is normal. Surround yourself with people who have the habits you want to have for yourself. The Bible sums it up as iron sharpens iron. So who are those in your life who are striving with the help of the Holy Spirit to live blameless lives, to be upright? Who are those who, who strive to cultivate peace in all of their relationships? Now hear me, this is not a call to limit the extent of our relationships to only those within the church family, but it is essential to our waiting for the Lord to cultivate deep relationships with those who exemplify faithfulness to our Lord, who will inspire greater and greater devotion to Jesus Christ. So to paraphrase that quote I just read from C.S. Lewis, that is why daily prayers and religious readings and church going are necessary parts of the Christian life. We have to be continually reminded of how to live as those who have been made new. While you are waiting for the Lord, you will be tested, you will get restless, and sometimes while you are waiting for the Lord, you may feel abandoned by the Lord. Psalm 37 ends with these encouraging words, the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Now those are really encouraging words. Until you stumble in your obedience and you begin to question if you really are saved or they are encouraging words until a prayer goes unanswered and you wonder if he really is your stronghold in a time of trouble those are encouraging words until you are going through an intense struggle and yet aren't being delivered this side of heaven. What then? Wait on the Lord and keep his way. Psalm 130, verse 6 says, I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. I've been on guard duty in the military. I've been on guard duty overnight, and I can tell you that those hours in the middle of the night, they just drag on. They seem to last forever. For me, it just seemed like the hours between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. were 12 hours instead of two hours. They just dragged on. I waited for the morning that sometimes felt like it would never come. And some of you are in those kinds of hours right now. You're in those between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. hours. And you are wondering if morning will ever come. Will you be delivered or has God abandoned you? Those hours are marked by hope, but they can also be marked by fear. In her book, a book I've referenced before, Prayer in the Night, Tish Warren writes about those hours, saying those hours are often marked by anxiety because, quote, we have no idea when morning will come or what will happen to us in the meantime. We can only walk through life one step at a time, huddled together with our friends, clinging to the circle of light we've been given and trusting God with what's beyond our sight. As Christians, we take up watching as a practice, as a task even. We stay on the lookout for grace. 
We proclaim that even in the deepest darkness, there is one we can trust who will not leave us. We believe that even if the worst comes to pass, there is a solidity to beauty, to God himself that will remain. Our posture of waiting does not deny the horrors of the night, but it bets on the morning to come. And she's right. And so we wait, but we also keep his way. She goes on to write, the believer's constant posture is to lean slightly forward in anticipation. We wait for God to act, to set things right, to show up and work, whether that work is surprising and miraculous or a quiet change of tides. We wait for the Lord. We wait for God to bring healing to the sick, peace in our conflict, encouragement and disappointment, clarity in our befuddlement, and sometimes he does. And sometimes he does. And sometimes the sick die. And the conflict worsens. The disappointment deepens. The confusion thickens. And yet we continue to watch and wait, knowing that the moment we can see this small circle of lantern light is not the whole road, not the whole story. And why are we so confident that the moment in front of us, especially in those 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. hours, are not the whole story? Well, let me quote her again. The Christian story proclaims that our ultimate hope does not lie in our lifetime in making life work for us on this side of the grave. We watch and wait for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We believe that this cosmic reordering has already begun in the resurrection of Christ. Jesus' resurrection is the sole evidence that love triumphs over death, that beauty outlives horror, that the meek will inherit the earth, that those who mourn will be comforted. The reason I continue watching and waiting, even as the world is shrouded in darkness, is because the things I long for are not rooted in wishful thinking or religious ritual, but are as solid as a stone rolled away. I read recently that the National Galleries of Scotland made a surprising discovery on the backside of a Vincent van Gogh painting. In preparing for an exhibit, Featuring Impressionist paintings, the museum was x-raying this Van Gogh painting, head of a peasant woman. And as a result of this x-ray, they discovered that there was more to the picture than meets the eye. On the reverse side, hidden by layers, underneath layers of glue and cardboard, was a self-portrait of Van Gogh. Right now, because of what you may be facing, you may feel abandoned. But the greater likelihood is that the rest of the picture, the big picture of what God is doing and will do, it's only obscured by the layers of struggle that are covering it up. But it's still there. The big picture is still at work. And the empty tomb confirms it. So keep your eye on the big picture. Keep watch for it, especially when it's really hard to see even a glimmer of it, because it's still there. It may seem elusive, but it's there. So how are you doing in this time of waiting? Is your faith being tested? Are you restless? Are you struggling with something and feeling abandoned? Maybe you're not waiting well. Maybe you're strained. Maybe you're drifting. Maybe you're on the edge of giving up your faith. 
It's okay if you feel that way. Just remember that God has not given up on you. To quote Lewis again, the great thing to remember is that though our feelings come and go, his love for us does not. It is not wearied by our sins or our indifference, and therefore it is quite relentless in its determination that we shall be cured of those sins at whatever cost to us, at whatever cost to him. In that airport, on the wrong side of security, I was getting worried. I was feeling very foolish. I didn't know how I was going to get back, and I couldn't fix it. But then, my deliverer showed up, just happened to be walking by. I didn't know him, but it was the head of security, or at least it was the supervisor of the security guard who was not going to let me back into the terminal area. And he saw this banter going on between me and that woman, and he stopped, and he asked her what was going on, and she told him, and he, and he looked at me, but not with a look of sympathy, more with a look of exasperation, which is a look I've gotten used to over the course of my lifetime. <laughs> and finally he says, come with me, and I go with him. And we go to this area of the airport where they have all the video footage that can be viewed by all the security people. There's a bunch of screens. And he asked one of the people to replay about 10 minutes of the camera that was focused on that section I had gone through. They back it up 10 minutes, and it verifies my story. I'm like, there I am, that's me, that's me. There's one going right behind her, you know. And he escorts me back to the area, back to the secure side, back to the terminal where I face a lot of exasperated looks from my family. But I made the flight. I was home safe. I've learned to wait better in airport terminals. We need to learn to wait better as we anticipate Christ's return. How you doing? Have you taken refuge in God? Are you continuing to take refuge in him as you wait? If it's been a struggle, if you strayed in the waiting, remember that Jesus is still your deliverer. As verse 40 says, the Lord helps them and delivers them. Who does God help? Does he help those who help themselves? No. He helps those who take refuge in him. Some of you have taken refuge in Jesus Christ. You have professed your faith in him as Lord and Savior. You have been buried with him and raised up a new person in baptism. But the waiting is a challenge. And so maybe today is a day of repentance for you, a day to reorient your life around living life God's way. Or maybe today is a day of refocusing for you, of, of taking your eye off the challenges that are in front of you to once again cast them on the big picture of what God will do because of what he has already done. Maybe today is a day of recommitment, of committing yourself to walk alongside those who are walking and keeping his way. And there's a few of you who have yet to take refuge in Christ. You have yet to declare your faith in him. You have yet to be identified in, with him in baptism. See, we're not the only ones waiting. Jesus is waiting too. He's waiting for you to come home because he wants everybody to take refuge in him. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But he won't force you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing are you willing today? Look at the big picture. You have nothing to lose that's worth keeping. And you have everything to gain. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are all waiting for you. But in this waiting, we 
all weighed in different ways and struggle in different ways. Find us faithful to continue to take refuge in you. And Lord, I pray for those who have never said yes to you, that they would do so today. Step out of the darkness and into the open arms of your son, Jesus. In his name I pray.